Now the impact of it, okay, so that's the first thing you do, that you, they don't see this deviation. What's its impact? Well, who cares, right? The, the reason why it's important is that, or one reason why it's important, is that the, if something's got an electric dipole moment, if the electron has an electric dipole moment, that breaks something called uh, time reversal symmetry, okay? So what does that mean? What time, what time reversal symmetry means is if you would rewound the, the, uh, the film, went backwards in time, you would see exactly the same as if you were going forwards in time. The presence of the electric dipole moment means that you violate that time reversal symmetry. It's no longer symmetric in time. That has a knock-on effect because there are, there's a, a property in particle physics which we believe is, re, is symmetric and that's the, the product of the charge times the parity. The parity is when you move from plus x to minus x times the time. So these three things together, CPT it's called. CPT symmetry we believe holds. If you break the T symmetry, that means you must also break the CP bit because together they hold. Okay, so now let me put the T symmetry aside. It's getting a bit complicated to hang in there. Why is the CP symmetry, why does that need to be broken? A fantastic physicist called Andrei Sakharov demonstrated that in order to account for the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, we need to break CP violation. We need to have CP violation. We need to break that asymmetry, that symmetry, sorry, between charge and parity in order to account for the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, which is what we observe. So, if I go back then, remember what I said, the, elect the observation of an electron, electric dipole moment of the electron would imply that you've broken T symmetry. If you've broken T symmetry, that implies you've broken CP symmetry. So if you've broken CP symmetry, and you've, it means you're beginning to understand the origin of the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So the measurement of this little quantity, which is so far not deviating from zero, but if it was to be measured, and when it's measured, then it's telling you something about the origin of matter-antimatter asymmetry, which is one of the big fundamental questions in particle physics. So that's one of the key reasons why it's such an important experiment. When the experiment's finished and it's done perfectly, mm -hmm. right. is a sphere the best result or is not quite a sphere the best result? Not quite a sphere. It has to be not quite a sphere. We know that it's not quite a sphere uh, because even in the, the standard model of particle physics that, that is already so well understood and explains many of the properties of particles and interactions, we know that there's already a mechanism in there which will create the electric dipole moment of the electron. It's just that it creates it at such a small level that actually it's not good enough to account for the matter-antimatter asymmetry. It breaks T violation, T symmetry, by such a small amount that it can't account for it. So we need something bigger. So we expect, that we expect it to be there. If it's not there, then something quite dramatic is happening in our understanding of the particle physics, and that, that may happen. And we might have to go back and to the drawing board and start that bit again. But so far, uh, the, the, the bounds are getting such that it's still eating into many of the particle physics models, but it hasn't gone all the way through them. So that it's, it's ruling out some of them, but it, there's still a whole load left. And of course, theorists being theorists, they'll come up with some ingenious mechanism which will explain why they've not seen it. But the idea is you will see it. I sh I sh perhaps it's worth just giving a little anecdotal, because uh, I've, I've known them and uh, uh, you know, they're a fantastic group. Ed, Ed came up and gave us a seminar, and uh, he explained, you know, was explaining the physics behind it and, and what they have to do in this amazing experiment. The big thing that they've been trying to do is, you know, th they've got to cut down the errors. If you've got a value that's zero, right, which is effectively what they've got, the, the sphere means this dipole moment is, is still consistent with being zero, then you better make sure that your errors around zero are so small that you've got a, you know, it's a sensible result to talk about. That means you have to get rid of what are called the systematic as well as the statistical. You do the experiment many, many times. They did that experiment over the course of three months, 25 million times. Okay, a lot of statistics. The systematics, are, you know, the apparatus, they have to mix, they have to have incredibly uniform electric fields. They have to shield 
the apparatus from magnetic fields. They mustn't have in ex external magnetic fields coming to spoil things. So all of this kind of um, systematic errors, they have to cut down and cut down and cut down. And they've done that, but they think they can do more. And so they think they can get this bound even lower and lower. But he was explaining that in, in their um, analysis, they have, they, look, they have all of these data, all this data. And of course, it's all done on the computer as well. They're analyzing it all on the computer. So there is a box there or a screen which will constantly be giving them the electric dipole moment. But they cover it up. Right? They've had it covered up because they don't want to be influenced by the, by the kind, as they're trying to reduce all their errors, they don't want to sort of be influenced and, and have a quick look and say, oh, if we just tweak that a bit more, we'll get this down. And, and it's very important you do that, that you, it must have been so difficult for them not to go and have a quick peek to see what they were seeing. And what they do is they eventually reach a stage where they think that they've basically accounted for everything they can possibly account for over that, you know, in a sensible time period. And uh, they pull the screen off. They pull the, the cover off the screen and they look. And I, I saw Ed Hines yesterday. I was on a panel with him and I asked him what, what it was like. And he said, they pulled it off. They had a meeting. They said, is, is it time? First time round, there was disagreement. People thought they could still work on a few more systematics. And eventually the group said, yes, let's do it. Pulled it off, saw the result. It was there. Opened a bottle of champagne. And uh, the world got to hear about it. The media has been portraying electrons now as the most spherical objects in the universe. Does that sound fair to you? In terms of the charge, yes, yeah. I still like to think of them as these point-like objects that, uh, you know, there is a bound on the size of the electron, right? You, from, from particle collisions, you put a bound on the actual physical size. And that bound is about, is the electron is less than 10 to the minus 18 meters. Just to remind you, the size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters, an angstrom. The size of the nucleus of the atom is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's a Fermi. So the size of the electron has been bounded. No one's seen a physical you know, point-like object that you could say, that's the electron. You see the distribution of the charge. And the, so the bound on the size, of the, the actual size is, is um, 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's, so it's less than that. So what we're looking at here is the, the charge distribution, and, and yeah, that's beautifully spherical. Amazing experiment, absolutely amazing. It's still way off. The, the, the experiment, in, in, in terms of units, it, it measures a, a, a deviation, an electric dipole moment of a, well, it, it's bounding it to be less than 10 to the minus 28. It's called E centimeters, electron charge times centimeters. The prediction from the standard model which, if you remember, I said was really small, is about 10 to the minus 39. It's still 10 orders of magnitude away. So if it ever reached down that level, then we've got to ask them serious questions. Where did the asymmetry of the matter-antimatter asymmetry of the universe come from? And that would be, that would be like scaling, probably like scaling the, the, if it went down to that size. In other words, if they didn't detect an electric dipole moment until you were down there, assuming they, they probably could never reach that degree of sensitivity anyway. But it would be like scaling the system up to something like the galaxy size and having a hair's width. Um, and then, then we'd be struggling to explain the matter-antimatter, but hopefully they'll see it in the next, they believe in the next two or three years, they'll be able to um, uh, increase the sensitivity maybe by a factor of 100, which would take them in, well into the realm of m most particle physics models that people seriously consider as candidates to explain the interactions of nature.